Okay, ban be be starting five. Yeah. Namaste and greetings. I, Bhanvi, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Vivam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Didli, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy learning. Today marks the inaugural day of Ending Gender-Based Violence, Cohort 2, Awareness of Policies and Governance. An online national spring school program a four-week online immersive certificate training course. This training program is organized by hashtag IMPRI Gender Impact Study Center, GISC. To kickstart the things, let's begin with a concise overview of the program. Ending gender-based violence in India is a complex and a multifaceted challenge that requires a comprehensive approach involving legal, social, cultural, and educational dimensions. While there have been significant efforts to address this issue, numerous challenges persist in the world. It is important to shed light on the urgency of addressing this critical societal challenge by policy awareness. So in a nation where the constitution promises equality, justice, and a life with dignity, the prevalence of crimes against women remains a glaring concern. Despite the existence of various legal provisions, including the Dowry Prohibition Act 1961, the Protection of Women Against Domestic Violence Act 2005, and the Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace Prevention, Prohibition and Redress Act 2013, Despite all this, the rising incidence of violence demand a deeper understanding of a legal system's entry cases. So in light of this, the IMPRI Gender Impact Study Center is proud to introduce this online training course that aims to unravel the complexities surrounding persistence violence against women, exploring not only the legal remedies available, but also their implementation aspects. It prompts critical thinking about the necessity for separate laws, the role of international legal provisions, the effectiveness of deterrence in eradicating violence, and the existing gaps between the legal frameworks and the ground realities. So by delving into these questions, the course seeks to stimulate dialogue on broader measures beyond the law to ensure the safety and well-being of women, challenging society to collectively address and rectify the root causes of gender-based violence. So we have an eminent panel for this program and the chair of this program is Professor Vibhuti Patelji, visiting distinguished professor at IMPRI, New Delhi. And this program has an excellent panel of experts who are going to share their expertise for the duration of this program. So I would like to introduce the distinguished expert panels that includes advocate Dr. Flavia Ignis G, women rights lawyer, co-founder, Majlis Legal Center, Mumbai, advocate Dr. Albertina Almeida G, lawyer and human rights activist, Goa, and a visiting senior fellow at IMPRI, Dr. Wahidan NRG, independent researcher, gender and human rights consultant, as well as a senior fellow at IMPRI, Professor BJ Lakshmi Nanda Ji, principal and professor of political science, Miranda House, University of Delhi, Professor Veena Vaswani Ji, Professor, Department of Forensic Medicine Director Center for Ethics, Program Director, YU, FIC Masters in Research, Ethics for India, Yinepoya deemed to be university, and a visiting professor at IMPRI, Ms. Anju Dubey Pandey Ji, formerly specialist, Ending Violence Against Women, and a team lead, Gender Responsive Governance, UN Women India, Dr. Padma Ji, Director, Sexual and Reproductive Health, CREA, former coordinator and a visiting senior fellow in PRE, Advocate Dr. Shalu Nigam Ji, visiting senior fellow in PRE, Advocate, author, researcher and a gender and human rights activist. Maya Vasti Ji, co-founder of Transgender Welfare Equity and Empowerment Trust Foundation. Advocate Selin Thomas Ji, Advocate, uh, at Selim Thomas and Associates, Bangalore, and a visiting senior fellow in PRI, Professor Soumya Ji, Professor Jin Jinzal Global School and Director, Center for Women's Rights, Dr. Kirsi Bolineni Ji, President Vas Vasavya Mahila Mandal Ji, 
एडवोकेट ऑद्रिदी मेलोजी डायरेक्टर मेजलिस लीगल सेंटर मुंबई विजिटिंग सीनियर फेलो इम्प्री नंदिनी सरकार जी डायरेक्टर ऑफ बिजनेस ऑपरेशन मैनेजमेंट सर्विसेस प्राइवेट लिमिटेड एंड मिस्टर हरीश साधनानी जी को फाउंडर एंड एग्जीक्यूटिव डायरेक्टर ऑफ मेन अगेंस्ट वायलेंस एंड अब्यूज एंड द पैनल ऑफ कन्वीनर्स इन कम्प्राइज ऑफ एडवोकेट डॉक्टर शालो निगम जी प्रोफेसर गोमदी श्रीदेवी जी विजिटिंग प्रोफेसर इम्प्री डॉक्टर सीमी मेहता सीईओ एंड एडिटोरियल डायरेक्टर इम्प्री एंड डॉक्टर अर्जुन कुमार डायरेक्टर एट इम्प्री so continuing with our commitment to fostering awareness and actionable insights i extend a warm welcome to all the participants engaging in this crucial discourse on ending gender based violence i express my gratitude for your keen interest and dedication in investing time energy and effort toward comprehending the intricate landscape of policies and governance surrounding this pervasive issue your participation plays a pivotal role and in uniting practitioners and enthusiasts alike creating a collaborative space for impactful policy research and advocacy so thank you for your invaluable contributions to this transformative course we have also shared the course outline and reading resources in your email for your kind perusal so before we start today's session i would like to remind the housekeeping announcements once again first please join the meeting on time there will be a q&a session after each presentation share your questions in the q&a box and not as an anonymous attendee ensure that your questions are precise and refrain from making general comments in the question to save time so now without any further ado let us start the program so it is my honor and privilege to invite the chair for the program professor vibhuti patel ji to start the program with her opening chair remarks over to you ma'am Thank you, Banvi, for introducing the course and setting the tone and the spirit of the course, which is very important. And it is also at a very historic juncture of, uh, of like uh, seventy-five years of International Women's Movement and the fight against violence against women. Uh, I would first of all like to thank Dr. Arjun Kumar, Dr. Simi Mehta, Ms. Ashtaba, Ms. Ritvika, Ms. Uh, Vaishali Singh. Ms. Uh, Priyanka Negi, Sri Satyam Tripathi, and uh, Ms. Vithita, uh, welcome, uh, and Dr. Shalu Nigam, of course, very, very important uh, person so far as this course is concerned, uh, and also welcome uh, Flavia Agnes, Madam, who would be joining us soon. Now, Women's Movement in India launched campaigns against uh, various forms of violence. first against women and then the gender awareness also came they fought against sexual violence domestic violence sexism in advertisements as well as against state repression during caste and communal riots in the early 80s so before that during the post emergency period in from say 1977 to 1980 small groups of women's rights activists in hyderabad bombay delhi madras Uh, had started taking up individual cases of custodial rape deaths of housewives under mysterious circumstances excesses by the state uh, enforcement machinery during the uh, social conflicts which had increased in number as well as intensity of the violence the mass of poor women involved in struggles for tribal people or industrial working class or the dalit movement faced misogyny from the members of their own organization social ostracism and also violence perpetrated by police military and paramilitary forces with these kinds of experiences of individual violence institutional violence systemic violence newly emerging women's movement uh, felt the necessity to put violence against women on its central political agenda while building up systematic campaigns in different socio cultural and geographical contexts of india and among women of different economic and socio cultural backgrounds and political persuasions they had to evolve a day to day tactics to be effective and long term strategies to carve out more space for women to gain gender justice within the criminal justice system within the judiciary uh, by judiciary in society at large their efforts resulted in series of legal reforms and gender responsive policies and programs and budgetary allocations so this is the very important to understand when we are developing conceptual understanding of how 
the gender-based violence became a very important issue. To build up an effective campaign, it is impo very important to concentrate on making ourselves aware of various nuances of gender-based violence and how to combat it. First, uh, women's groups have so far given major importance to preventive measures evolving support structures to help survivors of violence, filing legal cases, helping women to rebuild their lives. Uh, and I, the, the all resource persons who uh, are directly involved in this kind of work, and they'll be sharing their experiences as well as the learnings in the coming days uh, of this course. Uh, but women activists are increasingly realizing that it is not enough and we must strike at the root cause of violence. We need to be the change the value systems of our country, uh, of the people, existing structures that and engender uh, the uh, understanding to combat violence against women. And women's groups have shunned discussion on the subject with the men in the initial phase. But now the dialogues, like we also are going to have Harish Sadani, who is uh, who is a founder of Men Against Violence uh, Against Women, MAWA. Uh, it is increasingly felt that men should be involved in the process of combating violence against women and uh, other gender minorities. Uh, women's sexuality is socially constructed. Uh, transgender movement may question this. Given the patriarchal control over the existence of women, it becomes imperative that men are drawn into process of rethinking. Power equation that exists in the society and the patriarchy, the way it controls the uh, lives of the people who are perceived as weak and, and, and vulnerable. So it is very important to deconstruct patriarchy and the deep-rooted notions of a good woman versus bad woman or she deserves it or the ideology of victim, uh, victim blaming or finding fault with the victim. And that today's women are, expect too much or transgender people deserve to be violated. You know, that kind of ideology we need to challenge. Uh, we need to have more and more dialogue in the community, in the educational institutions and in the wherever we are working at the workplace because sexual harassment at workplace is, is declared as one of the most devastating uh, occupational hazard of the 21st century as women are increasingly entering the traditional male bastion. Uh, so the, the anxiety among men is also increasing. Uh, so gender-based violence is a violation of the bodily integrity and dignity. And we also need to fight the ideology and the language which of sexism, of misogyny. Uh, we have to have a dialogue with media. So efforts invested in this course are aimed at making of a collective conscience so that gender-based violence in any form is not tolerated. And this is how we are going to un uh, uh, discuss the whole issue in today's two sessions. First one is on the overview of the situation and then Flavia will also be addressing role of policy in addressing gender-based violence. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for gracefully introducing the program to all of us. So moving forward towards our first session of the day, that is on foundations of gender-based violence, its historical context and the definitions. I once again would like to invite you to take the floor. If you could kindly take it from here, ma'am. Yeah. Is my slide visible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. So when we talk about the historical context and issues and action strategies of violence against women, I think it's very important to understand the role of the women's rights movement globally as well as in our country has played. Okay, for the first time, like women social reformers, they also through their writings and through their action, if you read, say, Kavya Phule by Savitri by Phule or Behna by uh, Abhanga, where she talks about the daily grind and the violence that a woman, in fact, most of the women religious social reformers, right, from 12th century Janabai to 19th century social reformers had faced tremendous violence, domestic violence. Many of them had 
they were abandoned they had they, they had to leave their home uh, so the violence against uh, women has been a concern of any sensitive creative person but it was there in the name in the, in the form of individual struggles but the collective action against violence against women it started happening to some extent we can say during freedom movement it was person like pushpa mehta she forced the she 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 forced the viceroy of india to come up with the suicide report and uh, she really struggled hard she traveled all in different villages and she collected documents of why women were killing themselves by throwing themselves into the pond or a well or burning themselves or uh, burnt we don't know because they they had, there were no suicide notes at that time and uh, they were hanging they were found hanging and she forced the british government to come up with the suicide report finally it came out in 1930 as a result of which a certain shelter homes were created she was the first person who started who movement for vikas group vikas group is that when you are thrown out or you are you face domestic violence and you are deserted and your natal family also doesn't that doesn't support you you come to this vikas group where you don't have to lead a vegetative life you become get vocational education you study you become self dependent and rebuild your life it's such a revolutionary idea that we had we also had the same women like pushpa ben mehta mrudula amra amra and mrudula sarabhai and uh, also hansa ben mehta all of them were also involved in managing the refugee camps during partition and when thousands of women were abandoned by their families neither their in-laws nor their parents wanted to accept them these three women they prevailed upon the prime minister mr pandit pandit jawala nehru to start central social welfare board and allocate budget so that these women could rebuild their life so i think this kind of efforts were, were made even during that time but what we see that women themselves women survivors of violence or, or women women who have experienced varied forms of violence they also started talking about it that we are not fighting someone else's battle it is our own battle we have seen co- overt and covert form of violence in our, our life and the this self mobilization of women started happening in the 70s uh, first organization was progressive organization of women in hyderabad they they fought this launched a campaign against dowry uh, and during the emergency many of them were even arrested and the misa uh, and and in the post emergency period we saw that massive organizations against rape sexual violence and the atrocities perpetrated by police military and paramilitary forces became a central issue of the women's movement in 1975 when the un de- decided declared international women's year official organizations were talking about equality development and peace but the grassroots women's organization were bringing uh, out the concerns for violence against women so it is a women's movement which had brought this issue on a social uh, on a on a political agenda otherwise because they were talking about world peace the rebuttal by the women's movement was that peace begins from home so you have to take up the question domestic violence is not a personal problem rape is not a personal problem you can't use the ideology of women uh, 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 victim blaming that she asked for it she wore provocative dress who asked you to go out unescorted at night this kind of ideology can uh, 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 attitude of the criminal justice system of the media and of the community will not be allowed we have to understand violence against women as a manifestation of patriarchal uh, control over women's sexuality of fertility labor and bodily integrity and dignity in uh, copenhagen conference in 90 meet ticket conference also violence against women was a very important issue especially from the countries the latin america asia and uh, african countries all the neo colonial countries where they had seen that right from politics to social uh, this thing, uh, social uh, uh, milieu 
and the in the name of culture and tradition also various forms of violence were taking place and because of the fractured modernity at what level you talk about modernization but when women ask for their rights you you use violence uh, india signed and we know that in 78 un also came up with the convention on elimination of all forms of discrimination against women in which violence against women played a very was a very important uh, agenda India signed the CEDAW uh, document. Uh, many countries, I think over 160 countries signed the CEDAW document and took it as an important political action of the state and come up with the legal system or progressive legislations to combat violence against women. In the Nairobi forward-looking strategy end of the decade uh, in 1985, if you see the, and you can download this uh, Nairobi forward-looking strategy, there also, along with the developmental issue, uh, the, the violence against women was a very important concern. And the newer forms of violence that had, like, for example, acid attacks, which came uh, uh, during the Bangladesh war, the, the, the army had, Pakistani army had a, extremely sophisticated weapons and the com the people in Bangladesh, they, they did not have anything to defend themselves. They started using acid, for which is used for household cleaning, okay, put them in a plastic bag and throw it at the quote-unquote enemies. The same thing after the new nation was formed, the same acid was being thrown against any woman who was found to be fashionable or did not did not conform to their understanding of ideal woman. No? So the, 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 this kind of a new thing. Another issue of that African women's uh, organizations, African Women's Association for Research and Development, they also brought in the issue of FGM, female genital mutilation, which was earlierly seen as a custom. It is an African custom. 56 countries in Africa, they cut the clitoris of a woman. Okay, It was never even seen as gender-based violence. It was the women's movement in African countries which say that, no, it is an extremely barbaric custom. In fact, person like Nawal Sadavi, who was a doctor and was look, was dealing with such patients, who many of them died due to septicemia, she documented, wrote a book about it for which she was even in prison. So we saw that so many issues which were just hidden uh, from the human history, like we know that in, during 13th to 19th century, a lot of women were killed as witches uh, who did not conform to the so patriarchal model of a woman who would just be the breeder and homemaker. Uh, the, 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 they all were killed as witches. So even the new studies, uh, historical studies on violence became very important. In fact, currently also one uh, very uh, important article is, I think, making, uh, is being circulated in WhatsApp group. Uh, in India came up with a very comprehensive report on uh, uh, women and, uh, and uh, perspective for women uh, 1988 to 2000. Even Shram Shakti report mentions the occupational safety and hazard. Sexual harassment is a occupational hazard. Uh, 1993, India ratified CEDAW, and in that, as a result of which, what we got was uh, so many other comprehensive uh, laws, especially the formation of National Commission for Women, which was a uh, Recommendation way back in 1974 towards equality report. A platform for action in Beijing conference also. Violence, uh, combating violence against uh, women was a very important concern because by then decision was taken in the Vienna conference of the UNHRC uh, of uh, women's rights are human rights and combating violence against women uh, needs to be done on a consistent basis from 25th of November to 10th of December, because uh, it, the, the, it is so pervasive and it has existed for centuries. So we need uh, nearly 15 days of campaign every year to combat violence against women. And in Millennium Development Goal, initially it uh, did not include violence against women as a development goal, but we uh, it was the women's movement which uh, critiqued 
uh, w, uh, uh, goal number five, which talked about gender equality and the indicators of gender equality were only education, health, employment, and political participation and decision making, while they, there was no inclusion of safety of women. When such a high number of women are dying due to gender-based violence, so revision was made. And the, same, the, the limitation which initially MDG had Tribe were, were, were corrected. And in 2025, the Sustainable Development Goal, also violence free, the freedom from violence is a very, very important concern. So when you talk about gender justice or social justice or environmental justice or distributive justice, everywhere violence, gender based violence becomes a very important concern because you are trying to change the power equation. Those who have enjoyed power and privilege, for them, it is very difficult to, to share power or or, or 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 to see to it that this inequality is being challenged no? so women's rights are human rights that was the slogan which emerged from the vienna conference and that how do we see conceptually the question of whole power uh, power unequal power relation that results in gender based violence so you have preva prevailing realities that of inequality you have certain instruments such as Constitution of India or UDHR, which talk about equality, Constitution of India, Article 14, 15, 16. When they talk about equality, equal opportunity, freedom, dignity, liberty. But your social location is such because of the intersectional vulnerability that some people are able to enjoy the fruits of uh, constitutional guarantee. Others are not. Then what do you need? You need equity. How would you get the equity? It can come because of the bottom-up uh, bottom approach of the women's movement and social movement. It can come laterally because women start demanding their uh, the equality. And it can also come because of some of the new legislations, for example, uh, sexual prevention of sexual harassment at workplace where the state takes responsibility. Most of the uh, laws regarding gender-based violence, where the, it is a violation against the state. So that is a, and you provide certain measures, you provide by budgetary allocation, you provide one stop crisis center, you provide shelter, and also hand holding of a survivor of violence to rebuild their life. These are the measures of equity. And even with that, you also or you see that the the the, the so social uh, situation or the cultural values are such that even with equity you face a lot of injustices. So finally, you also need to punish those who are perpetrating violence. So this whole journey, it's very important to understand, uh, to come up with any strategies, long-term strategies, as well as immediate tactics. Domestic violence, a, a definition of it has been uh, def uh, is defined in the DV Act, uh, Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act, which means actual abuse or threat of abuse, whether physical, sexual, verbal, emotional, or economic. We had a section 140 uh, 498A, about which I think Advocate Salunikam will be telling us a lot. And the, this law takes care of both the civil and the criminal dimension, uh, which uh, protection of women from this is called Powder Act 2005, which recognizes the right to residence, provision for appointment of protection officers and recognition of service providers. Who are the service providers? Hospitals, police station, shelter home, uh, uh, counselors, protection officers, they are the service providers. So we need budget for their salary. We need a place uh, where, where, where the, the survivors can go. Uh, training for protection officers and judges, awareness creation, and budget allocation at all three levels, national, subnational, and the Panchayati Raj institution level. Sexual violence, there are three very important laws about which I think Shalunikam will be talking in her special sessions that we have for different laws. One is the POCSO Act 2012. Second one, the amendments in the uh, antiquated rape law that we got uh, after the Nirbhaya tragedy and the uh, massive protests that our country had, Parliament of India, uh, unanimously passed the, you know, the amendments in the Evidence Act. But still, 
we saw that two on two counts we have lost out the battle for example marital rape and the apsa act like um, when the husband or army man are accused of rape they are above the law and the argument which was used by India, our parliamentarian was that that if we make husband a culprit of rape then the institution of family will get destabilized and if the army man are accused of rape and if we try them and uh, then then morale of indian army will be shattered and it will be affected and that these are the two arguments which were used in the parliament but still the battle is going on women are using the uh, prevention of domestic violence act in which is defines violence as a economic violence physical violence emotional violence psychological violence and sexual violence Prevention of Sexual Harassment Act at Workplace 2013 came after Bar Babri Devi's uh, gang rape. Uh, we, first we got was a Vishakha directive and now we have this law. Section 509 involves using word, gesture or acts that are intended to insult or offend women's modesty. There are, this language itself has a lot of problem and I think Supreme Court of India has recently given a direct a directive or, or or a come up with the handbook that what kind of language uh, should be used in the court by the lawyers as well as judges in the judgment uh, institutional mechanism to address instances of sexual harassment and training of functionaries they are appointed and that's what the law demands from all the employers uh, we also had a uh, um, uh, India adopted unanimously, our parliament adopted um, women empowerment policy with four aspects of welfare, access, conscientization and participation. I think it is self-explanatory. The policy is very crisp and it has a life cycle approach. It, it is in, available in all Indian languages. You can download it easily from the internet. PCP NDT Act about which the when the campaign against sex selective abortion started, uh, it and the lot of documentation was provided and lot of legal uh, workshops were also held. Finally, we got the NDT Act in Maharashtra in 1988. By uh, then, people started going to neighboring states. So we had a PNDT Act in Gujarat and PNDT Act in Karnataka. But what was required was a National Umbrella Act. And finally, in, in 1994, we got the PNDT Act uh, uh, applicable to whole of India. But it had many loopholes and the public interest litigation was filed by Sehat and Masum uh, and Dr. Sabu George, who was, uh, who, uh, who was himself a nutritionist. And when he had gone to do his field work in Tamil Nadu, he saw so many, so many babies uh, being abandoned, thrown in the garbage. There were the small, newly born babies uh, they, they, and, and he decided to give up his career and concentrate on save the girl child. In fact, the whole save the girl child slogan that we have, that was his, uh, he had uh, coined it. So PNDT Act 2002 was, uh, uh, is now also applicable. Some of the states are quite proactive in its implementation, but there is a massive connivance of the authorities and the uh, uh, diagnostic center owners. And that's why we see the, uh, there is a lot of loophole at the operational level, a lot of problems are there. And st now also we see a UNFPA report shows that sex ratio has become even more adverse. Currently, we don't have data, but uh, during the pandemic, PCP NDT Act was also freezed, which resulted in a massive abuse of uh, technologies, ultrasound uh, technologies for selective elimination of female fetus. A transgender Persons Protection of Right 2019, it is an act of parliament which was hurriedly passed and it has so many limitations. Transgender community is extremely angry with this act because there is a less punishment for rape if for transgender person. Generally, when the gang rape or a rape of a woman or a child takes place, seven and a half years of rigorous punishment is given. We saw even in case of, say, First uh, anti-rape campaign we had uh, in solidarity for Mathura. In that also we had seen that the the 
Bombay High Court had given 10 years of rigorous imprisonment to the policeman who, who had raped Mathura. But in case of transgender person, it's only two years of uh, jail uh, imprisonment. Moreover, this act doesn't make any commitment about the developmental needs of transgender persons who are them who are who are abandoned by their own family members, biological family members. So no reservation for job, no no nothing, no, no provision for their educational needs, their housing, the elderly uh, transgender persons pension or, or their livelihood needs. Nothing is no commitment is made by this law. And that's why there is a lot of, now also, a lot of uh, anger. And there are several public interest litigations filed by the transgender communities, organizations. Uh, what we see that after the pandemic, so many uh, evils which we thought that we were, a, we were a successful in addressing them have now researched uh, child marriage, child trafficking, forced child labor, Child, children being forced out of education happened massively during the two years of pandemic. And it reminded us of what struggle uh, was waged uh, way back in 1884 uh, by, by, by person like uh, uh, social reformers had done it and, and what uh, they wrote about uh, this wicked practice of child marriage has destroyed happiness of my life. It comes between me and things which I prize above all others. Study, mental cultivation, without least fault of mine, I am doomed to seclusion. Even every aspiration of mine is looked down upon with suspicion and is interpreted in most uncharitable manner. This was a girl, Rakma Bai Savi, who was married as a uh, as a child and and uh, her husband was uh, 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 Rakma Bai was a very studious person. She had highly me cultivated mental faculty, and that boy was not a match. And she refused to go go have it with her husband. And she's the 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 massive national level polarization of public opinion took place. And there were those who were revivalists who said that Rakma Bai was challenging the Indian custom for a Hindu woman once the husband is, uh, the marriage is solemnized, uh, husband is her husband for seven lives. How can Rakma Bai not go to her husband? And if she does this, then she should be imprisoned. Rakma Bai, is a she said that she was ready to be imprisoned, but she would never cohabit with that man who, who was no match for her, who, who, who was not, who was very crude and he was in a bad habits. And uh, finally, this letter, which she wrote uh, to Vice Viceroy of India, was published in a front page of Times of India. And uh, uh, she, she, uh, Viceroy declared that she should not be imprisoned. Rakma Bai became a doctor. She served till the age of 96. She was a freedom fighter. She established so many uh, uh, medical colleges in medical uh, civil hospital in Pune, civil hospital in Surat, civil hospital in Rajkot, uh, where all the progressive kings invited her to 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 uh, provide medical services. So we can see that whenever there is a little support by the system, by the individuals, women who are facing gender-based violence can can flourish. Uh, luckily for Rakma Bai, even her her mother's her, uh, her stepfather because her, her mother became widow when she was very young. The stepfather was also very progressive and supported her education. Uh, what we see, these are the pictures of the pandemic. At the time of pandemic, the cruelties which happened in terms of a, PC, a violation of PCP NDT Act or child marriages or forced child labor or trafficking on a massive scale or, or massive domestic violence, uh, I think we have a major challenge now to make a concerted effort to fight all these evil practices. In fact, people say that we the wheels of history have turned back in a backward direction. We have to really make extra effort, three times more effort to see to it that whatever we achieve in the social reform movement, in the freedom movement, due, uh, during the 70s and 80s because of the women's rights movement is very important. Legal awareness about violence against women, we all are doing. But now we need to create the structures and systems which can which can provide very important uh, 
uh, support system to for the survivors of violence and see to it that the, uh, the violence against women is prevented in a big way. There are newer issues. We are newer challenges we are facing now. It's a witch hunting in a big way. Honor crimes, uh, they are also. And the cyberbullying. These are the new issues in last three, four, five years we are seeing escalated on a big scale. Even the NRI marriages, the what happens to women who get married. Earlier, NRI marriages were located only in Punjab and Gujarat. But now we see that from six southern states also women are marrying. They, they are in a great trouble once they go to the newer destination, they leave India. So even we need to create the legal pro protection for the women who are suffering in other countries. And we have to do the sensitization of our embassies also. Home Ministry has recorded more than 12,000 complaints from the women who are, who, who are duped, cheated, and brutalized in the NRI marriages. Me Too movement, we have learned in over the last five, say seven years, Me Too movement has caught the attention of the women's movement and the policymakers. The people are using when you don't get justice through the existing structures, you use the social media. So, so many testimonies with, uh, of uh, sexual harassment in the film industry, in the uh, media, uh, in the judiciary, uh, for the interns, legal interns, or in the academic world, or in the informal sector, women have given their testimony through social media. And we need to be very sympathetic to uh, women who are giving their testimony. We have to stand by them and we have to see to it that it is basically the people in power who are completely insensitive. And as a result of which young women, young entrant in the career, they, they face so much of uh, you know, harassment, but they don't get any redressal. And that's why they are using social media. So Me Too movement is not women against men. Me Too movement is all of us against the toxic patriarchy. Uh, what we see, the cyber violence is a newer form of violence. We need to have a more and more awareness about cyber violence. Uh, we saw the phenomenon of boys locker room in Bombay also, in one of the most uh, schools, international schools of the where the richest people's children go. Same happened in Mumbai, uh, in Delhi also. So I think we, the shadow pandemic of toxic patriarchy that we need to fight in all the forms and uh, we need to create the helplines the way the response is certain state governments responded by uh, creating helplines which were uh, active throughout the day and night I think that is very important we need to understand this whole uh, issue of uh, uh, violence against women uh, whether it is in domestic arena or in uh, in the um, uh, public life. So we need to be aware about it. We have to see the interconnections between individual incidents of violence and how the systems and structures, they respond to this kind of uh, violence. Uh, the We need to create more and more specific, issue-specific helplines, the way women's movement created it immediately after declaration of lockdown during the pandemic. So it is not only during the pandemic, but in a post-pandemic period also, we need such helplines, more so in the regional language. Uh, so it is, and we also need to create the various methods if the survivor of violence cannot speak because of the proximity of the abuser, then we need to create various ways of doing handholding of the survivor. And we need to understand that if we don't take Phenomena such as boys locker room or the jokes which we are getting, rape jokes we are getting in the WhatsApp or Instagram or the the political leaders talking about boys will be boys and they, 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 the men are hunter and women are prey. That kind of sexist, homophobic or transphobic jokes and objectification. If we don't stop them uh, in the initial phase and confront them, then what will happen? The, our gender roles will be solidified. Uh, glass ceilings at workplaces, gender stereotypes in the uh, every life, whether it's in education or politics or in community, will per persist. Stalking, teasing, revenge porn, rape threat, harassment will be uh, completely ignored. Rape, and, and if we don't challenge that also, then the ultimately it would happen into rape 
or sexual coercion and physical abuse and also finally even the murder of a uh, uh, victim because that's what is happening now you can see more and more young girls below 18 they are the ones who are targeted by the predators and they are also killed to kill the evidences. So I think we need to understand these interconnections and fight at the very, very, it, it, nobody can have a casual way of dealing with gender-based violence. These are the um, uh, cyber crimes that are happening and we need to create more awareness about it. And uh, we also need to make the uh, uh, legal awareness as a mandatory in all the training programs of the trade unions, of political parties, of our educational institutions, right from schools and even in parent-teachers meeting, we need to have. And that is why I think uh, 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 we need to, this is a letter written by a man that violence against women is a man's issue. It is not only a women's issue. Every responsible citizen has to respond to it. Uh, what we saw during the migration also, yeah, the reverse migration, women faced massive violence, which was not even recorded by the criminal justice system. It is only the women's organizations and the trade unions and SHGs where they gave the testimony of the miseries they fought, violation of their reproductive rights that they faced. I think we should never forget this because if so that in future, whenever such thing happens, we are able to uh, combat it more effectively. Instead of curbing women's mobility, we should curb uh, we should curb violence against women, and we should take preventive measures against it. These are some of the important reports prepared by several women's groups collectively. So they they uh, shared their data of providing support to the survivors of violence during the pandemic, and they have come up with the reports which are in the public domain. All these six reports which I have quoted, they were they were prepared uh, after 20, uh, 2020 and uh, they, they have shared their experiences uh, and they can be extremely useful to come out with our own action plan for combating violence against women. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your in invaluable insights and for delving into the foundational aspects of this critical issue and providing us with the essential context and the perspectives. So now the floor is open for questions from the audience. Uh, anyone from the in the audience can raise their hands or they can type their questions in the Q&A box. Ishmit Kaur says that will we get PPT being shared? Definitely. I share it right away. So anyone in the audience have any question can either raise their hand or type in the Q&A box. Or else ma'am, I have a small question. Yeah. So since you mentioned about the cyber bullying and the rise in uh, crime against women because of the exposure to online content, I would say. So the, I was reading somewhere that there has been a 40% rise in the sex trafficking that the victims are recruited through online mode. Yes. So uh, you mentioned about the helpline number. Uh, despite that, are there any measures that are being taken for the companies that can help us in preventing and addressing the gender-based violence that are occurring because of this, that online platforms or how we can help those companies accountable for fostering safe online environments? Because technology has become a new normal. We can't get rid of it. Correct. So I think it's not only companies, but even they are targeting more and more adolescent girls, no? So even the educational institutions and the community-based organizations, uh, civil society organization, all of them have to join this movement because uh, children are accessing these web portals even in the homes, no? And they get, so you see, if you see the individual uh, testimonies of these young girls who have been uh, trafficked or who are 
uh, uh, called by, uh, invited by their boyfriend to attend party and then they are given less drink and then they are raped and all all these things are happening even at home so i think even in pta meeting parent teachers association meeting also it has to be discussed and the way national commission for women had started a massive uh, training programs throughout the con pandemic period now they have stopped but in 1920 2021 there were lots of programs all colleges were told and we were inviting the cyber police cyber crime branch no to uh, educate and orient the uh, young people both boys and girls boys can also be trafficked so um, uh, so i think that kind of capacity building has to be done by everybody uh, not only employers because employers they are basically major people and working people they get they they get uh, targeted for cheating and fraud but when it comes to sexual crime trafficking selling a person it happens with the housewives it happens with the people who are desirous of going abroad and work so there are so many nurses they were also trafficked no to the gulf countries after going there they they were badly abused they were not they were recruited as nurses but they were taken the website was so attractive that women applied nurses applied online and they were given a very rosy picture of the destination and after they reached there it was nothing they they were forced into uh, sexual work and uh, slavery and domestic work and brutalized also very badly so it is happening Uh, so it is all pervasive what i want to say is that not only employers who have to do that yeah but yeah thank you nati so, here yeah uh, nati yeah i just wanted to uh, add more highlight on toxic patriarchy like uh, different because you have covered quite a wide range from uh, ancient time to now how the violence has come up so that was something very uh, means we could learn from but just a little more highlight on a toxic patriarchy yeah. yes see, see there are one can be liberal patriarchy okay that i allow my daughter to study i allow my wife to work i am i am uh, patriarch but whenever she is like cook that's a liberal patriarchy then you have a uh, what you call benevolent patriarchy so all the social reformers of 19th century they were benevolent patriarch because the otherwise the 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 toxic patriarchy of that time would not even allow a women to to have a widows to have a dignified life or they they would ask them to burn, that widows should be burned who believe in double standard of sexual morality who use uh, who believe that women, to tame women and to make them ideal women you have to use violence okay so that is a toxic teaching them lesson continuously and showing them their place where your place is that is a toxic patriarchy then you also have a vicarious patriarchy that you <laughs> you see that vicarious patriarchy you see more in a whatsapp groups no that oh, i am scared of my wife i won't say anything but but i will be very happy when someone else is beats them up no so she deserves it ha good good usko sabak sikhaya taming of the shrew if you talk about you no know, like shakespeare's taming of the shrew it it, it is very much of a vicarious spectre toxic patriarchy is one that it is never they, there is no sense of guilt they they gloat in their abusive power that is toxic it's like a nashe mein dhut pitru satta no that you you don't even feel that the in so many testimonies i think you nati you also must have when you when we go to the prison and the, the uh, rapist who, who who has no form about what he had done heinous crime no in fact the chakti mil case all those six boys when they were interviewed by the um, counselor there was no as no sense of guilt they did not feel that they had done anything wrong the same thing i think nirbhaya case also all those uh, boys they they did not feel that there was anything wrong with it they internalized it in such a way and they they uh, 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 shakti mil boys they also said they, in the past also they had done it but nobody had questioned them so uh, ma'am i have a question i had a question yeah yeah so yeah. my name is pallavi and i wanted to ask and thank you for your invaluable you know insight on this area i just wanted to know this one thing is that 
we have been hearing of the term uh, reproductive justice so much. Yeah. And my question is that can we um, or should we problematize the term justice? Because whenever we talk about justice, there always that center margin uh, conversation that comes up as in who served the justice and who is being served. We have penal codes. Yeah. I mean, the term itself is very, you know, phallocentric. So my question is that should we also uh, be very critical about using words like uh, reproductive justice because the you know Supreme Court or whoever serves the justice also does not exist in a social vacuum. They are very much conditioned by so many factors around them. So yeah. I just wanted your you know opinion on that. What do you think? What would be the alternative to justice? What would be the other term? Rights, yes. With reproductive rights, we say. But when a woman is forced to... Uh, about a female fetus, won't doesn't it become a issue of reproductive justice or a court which would come totally neglect? Like if you see, there are so many judgments in which a girl child is raped and uh, judge even a woman judge she says that this boy, we can't imprison the boy because uh, he not man because the he's a sole breadwinner. And who is the, he has old parents to look after without talking about a word about the pain of this girl and what are the consequences this survivor of rape will have to face. Flavia is here with us. Flavia, can you delve on this subject? What can, can, is there any other better term for reproductive? Actually, we are so used to using the word justice and we can't think beyond it. And I think the core issue here is justice. Because what the girl demands is not mercy, not uh, benevolence, but her right as an individual, as a citizen, under the constitution. She has to be treated equally and she has to be treated with respect. So in this con context, uh, the word that we can think of is only justice and rights. These go together, justice and rights. Uh, apart from that, we don't want benevolence. We don't want mercy. We don't want uh, gratitude from the state, <coughs> from a patriarchal state. <coughs> we want to be treated as equal citizens. And that's our right under the constitution. <coughs> Hence the word rights and justice. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Manish Kumarji. Yeah, ma'am, I've typed the question also. Yeah. I was asking, like, despite the um, yeah. uh, reservation women are getting in uh, politics, like in Panchayati Raj elections, still in northern parts of India, we see the concepts like Pati uh, Pratinidhi, where male members are taking decision despite women. So what are the solutions to it? Like, what are the way forward so that women can take the decisions on their own? The recent study uh, of UNDP has shown that in 46% of elected representatives are taking their own decision. Okay. It is 54% still have this, what you call Sarpanjpati. But here also I see sexism because even male elected representatives in so many times, they are not taking independent decision. They are taking whatever their party bosses or their personal interests, if they, the villages and all, whatever the patriarch of their family they share. But we don't call them puppets. Only when it comes to women, we call them puppets. No, So here also that bias is there. But the recent study has shown, because now we have had a six rounds of uh, local cell government elections. Because the law came in 1994. And in the last 30 years, there have been six rounds of elections. And we, the new leadership that has happened. When in a history, women were not even allowed to take part in public uh, life, at least uh, during the pen, uh, during the freedom movement, at least women fought against uh, uh, British rule and common women also came out on the streets and that helped giving up parda and come into public life. But with uh, throughout the civilization, women were not given place in the public life and first time they are getting it in 1994 due to 73rd and 74th amendment uh, and then uh, uh, instead of holding their hand in enhancing their capacity governance is a complex issue definitely for anybody and and for continuous uh, hand holding is required uh, we would always deride them as a sarpanchpati no that is really uh, uh, sad uh, and people like us, myself, Levia, all of us, Shaluji, all of us, we do uh, always do the training of women who are in the 
uh, elected representative. We started way back in 1994. And some of these women corporators, they are so articulate. Even during the pandemic, we saw they were the front. They, they were going to the their constituency. They were not holding only Zoom call meetings. No, They were actually going and supporting and using their area development fund in Bombay it is one crore per year and they use their fund also for providing support to the uh, for this. so I think creation of enabling environment is most important with state and non-state actors both will have to do state will also have to enhance the capacity building program and also provide protection when the Chalo Dili campaign where 5,000 women elected representatives went from their villages to Delhi, they, they had a 12 point program, they demanded they needed helpline, they needed uh, adequate fund, why do we treat uh, women in the local cell government bodies as beggars all the funds is cornered by the state government, why can't they, so I think when we talk about democratic decentralization it has to be backed by funding so that they can nurture their community unless you nurture your community and you develop your community nobody will respect you so that is very important so and even capacity of uh, all the how to write proposals and how to do double entry accounts and how to make revenue accounts and expenditure accounts and balance sheet and all those things which are very important. Like Rajasthan, we saw Rajasthan passed a uh, resolution that they would allow only 12th pass women to contest election. And now you have a very young women, BA, MA, MBA, CA, all of them are uh, uh, elected in Gram Sabha and Panchayat and Pradhan. Scenario has changed. They are self-dependent. They decide their own agenda. So I think we need to create that kind of environment, uh, both the government as well as the non-government organizations and educational institutions. It's, it's very important and valid question. Good yes. evening, uh, ma'am. Uh, may I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, good evening, ma'am. This is uh, Dr. Simreen. Ma'am, what? it's just an observation. Maybe I'm wrong. But what I felt is when we ask our De dealing DV Act at the grassroots level, we don't have immediate solution for our, uh, you know, the, the victim per se. So being a, a lot teacher, being part of uh, our own legal aid committee and all, we go to a lot of villages and everywhere. And every time when I go there and I see that, you know, there are women who are really suffering, but they are scared because we, we cannot provide them with immediate solutions. So the DV Act itself, don't we think that even after 20 years, we lack in something, you know, kind of a relief to the women per se, you know, after the investigation and everything we can provide her. But what, uh, instead of, you know, something called less that something of, or something we can provide to her, uh, especially in smaller cities, for example, in Mumbai, Delhi or uh, Pune or let's suppose Bangalore, we have things. But what about uh, small places near Lucknow, like uh, Rai Bareilly or places like that? I think this is the question to be directed to Flavia because that's what her presentation is going to be. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Ishmeet. I'm uh, from Central University of Gujarat. Yeah. Uh, basically, I mean, I have a very basic question. Uh, you know, when it comes to women uh, about women's rights, uh, women themselves are quite divided you know, when it comes to property rights or even when it comes to stigmas around menstruation, uh, you know, it's the women who are, who are like, uh, in fact, promoting, you know, the stigmas around menstruation. So the question basically is, how do we reach out to women, you know, uh, because it's a very complicated thing. I mean, there are different sectors of women, different kinds of classes, castes, Middle class, uh, I think, is a space where there is least awareness in that sense. One is in their comfort zone. So so how could one, you know, reach out or, or what could one do about it? So I think first thing is that uh, you uh, try to do awareness generation, but still there will be women who would be taking very, very misogynist. They would have internalized misogyny and violence against girls and women. So you, you, for that, I think we have to combat, we have to fast, uh, and we have to do the hand-holding of the, the targets. Okay, so that is a one, uh, and that's what women's movement has done always. So whether it is in a question of mother-in-law harassing daughter-in-law or 
this menstrual currently so many young uh, couples they are fighting against this stigma of menstruation tribal women first generation of educated tribal girls i attended a meeting in kolhapur where they had a meeting of uh, uh, women activists and anganwadi workers asha workers from all over maharashtra these young women they are opposing they say that they can't be thrown out of the village during their menstruation because they create one they they build one hut in which they had to say it is very risky for them to be there for five days they, they so many of them they get bitten by snake and scorpion most of the tribal villages now are not isolated either the state highway or the national highway passes there so truckers also know that here is a hut and there may be some girl or a woman so they are opposing so internally also a lot of protest is coming up about this kind of a misogynistic behavior and we have to do the hand holding and support them and i think criminal justice system is also has to respond to the uh, this kind of violation uh, and uh, awareness yes that is always we do but still there are some hardcore who would not uh, accept the progressive stance and we have to take sides of those who are uh, at the receiving end of violence i just want so, to add uh, something here yeah 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 flip um you know when we talk about women we talk about women as a category but when we talk about men we talk. we don't talk men as a category mm. we see men are fighting against men we don't say that mm. everywhere all wars we focus on by men. and men are fighting against men correct when it comes to women we mm. think all women are same they don't have categories yeah. there's no class there's no caste uh, there is no uh, other divides of the village uh, within the village etc and we think why women are fighting even class as mother in law daughter in law they belong to a different class within the patriarchy so we cannot think of women as a unit and we cannot raise this question why women are against women everybody is against everybody even in the family two sisters mm -hmm. fight or mother and daughter fight so everywhere you will see it So you cannot say why women are against women. Women are bound to be against women, but we need to look at oppression. We look, need to look at power structures, oppressive power structures, and then position ourselves to see how we can uh, help a particular woman. Mm. So you don't have to belong to women's movement. When you see oppression anywhere, men or women can help better the woman. So it's not only the domain of the women, but it's the domain of the society as a whole. Uh, that, uh, ma'am, uh, said. Um, my larger question is basically about you know when it comes to um, othering in the sense of uh, tribal communities, like ma'am has given an example, you know, of women being sent to sheds and uh, shelter houses outside, you know, their homes. the larger problem is within the family units you know where uh, and particularly this question of menstruation you know where the mother is teaching the girl to not to pray or to sleep on floor you know and the mother is not being able to even give it up because of certain kind of cultural and religious you know beliefs which she really believes in and and that's happening even today i mean uh, a lot of uh, you know students in the university both pg students and phd students and come and say that you know our mothers are doing this to us right how do we overcome that you know so so that's i mean it's not just about women fighting against women but it's it's more kind of in, you know something which they have internalized and they're not able to recognize that you know that is going against us you know so and there is also so, fear of social ostracization that is also there yes the hmm. community caste the structures are so powerful so that is also there. yeah hmm. yeah yeah thank you thank you ma'am ma'am there is one question in the chat yeah 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 i just read out the question pallavi pallavi girolkar would you like to unmute and speak pallavi ji yeah yeah you can read out 
So, ma'am, basically, she is asking, what in your understanding is the gap in gap in spreading awareness and making young girls comfortable to share and register uh, the violence they face in schools, coaching centers, and also in their own families sometimes? And what are the requirements to make their families, and especially mothers, to sp- support their children? Yeah, I think that's what we have been doing right from the beginning of the women's movement. That in schools, no, the uh, safe touch and safe touch, and also speaking out that the, the the sense of shame should not be there, and we need to discuss it in PTA parent teachers uh, uh, meeting also PTA meeting which are now mandatory, okay, for every school and educational institution to be sympathetic because why do children don't tell whether it's a boy or a girl when they face uh, any kind of sexual aggression they confide to teacher they confide to counselor but they don't confide to their parents so the democratization of family create an ecosystem create a atmosphere in the family where children feel safe to uh, to tell their parents no and and parents should stand by and wherever it happens action is taken most of the cases of um, children uh, who have uh, like uh, who have been supported by their parents, they have been able to combat it. Otherwise, they suffer in silence. So I think we need to also do the council uh, all in the schools. Yes, schools and uh, uh, this thing, child sex, more awareness about Pokso Act, not only by telling them what the law is, but also showing the films, showing uh, dealing case studies, writing, uh, say, essays, uh, essay competition, poster competition about the issues of my body, my right, or the what What do we mean by uh, safe touch and unsafe touch? So this is a way we can do the consciousness among the teachers and uh, students. It should be part of the refresher course, orientation program, faculty induction program, faculty development program, both in schools and colleges. And also now the WDCs have been uh, established in the college, this thing. So there it should be there. Because junior college students are below 18. They are 16, 17 year old. So it's very, very important. And yeah, thank you, ma'am. I think you have addressed almost all the questions and queries. Rest we can take after the session. Yeah. So thank you, ma'am, for guiding us through our first session and patiently answering all the questions. So there is a little bit change in the structure. We will be now going to Flavia, ma'am, and then we will be coming to the Shalu, ma'am. If, is that fine with you, ma'am? Shalu, ma'am? Yes, please, please. Okay. okay. So with this, we now move on to our next session that is on the role of policies in addressing gender-based violence and an overview on the same by advocate Dr. Flavia Ma, uh, who is a women rights lawyer and a co-founder of Majlis Legal Center, Mumbai. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vibhuti, for having me in this inaugural uh, lecture. I'm very grateful to you. And... Uh, it's a very important subject. Firstly, let me introduce myself. I'm part of the women's movement. And my entire uh, life has been in the public campaigns along with Vibhuti. And both of us have been very uh, important uh, activists in the women's movement. In addition to what else we do uh, academically or uh, professionally. So my entire issue has been uh, law reform. Gender-based violence and law reform. When the women's movement started, it started specifically about a rape case. Now, before that, let me tell you two things. Uh, You must have, uh, which is in the news today, you must have heard about the Jharkhand rape case. Uh, A foreigner woman, Spanish woman, I think, was raped by seven men. Uh, and uh, investigations are going on. Three uh, men have been arrested. Uh, four are yet to be arrested. They have been identified but not arrested yet uh, because they cannot be uh, traced. And I've been receiving so many uh, calls to comment on it. Why women are raped? Why foreigner women are raped? And one has no answer. Because we've been with this campaign since 1980. And there, I'm not saying there are no changes. There are a lot of changes. Yet rapes continue. And uh, children are vulnerable. Foreigners are vulnerable. Women in general are vulner- vulnerable. And this law acts very slowly. And is not proven to be a deterrent. Though efforts are being made, it's not really deterrent. 
So this is one issue that is today topical about this uh, rape of this foreigner woman. And a lot of media attention has put on this. The second major issue that is there today, topic of discussion, is uh, France has made the right to abortion a constitutional right. And there have been a lot of discussion on that, that it cannot be reversed. It cannot be uh, rolled back. No matter which government comes, because it is made part of the constitution, and with the overwhelming majority, I think in the whole legislature only seventy-two people opposed it. More than three seventy people have supported it, and this is a very important landmark on the eve of the women's movement. So I just want to flag these issues. One is about reproductive rights, my body, my my choice, my right over my own body. So this is very, very important. So I'll just flag this issue. And I want to indicate that the issues that we started with the campaign and uh, addressing public policy, law reform, bringing in newer legislations, etc., has been a very important uh, campaign for us, very important starter. But the struggle has to go on. It's not ended. If you, when you see issues like this, you see that it is not ended. It's a continuous struggle. And not only our generation, next generation, and even the next generation after that. All of us have to struggle to get this done. So let me talk about the uh, uh, campaign for law reform, which has been an important plank of the women's movement. So this is the uh, background. So let me uh, address some of the crucial issues here. Firstly, the rape anti-rape movement. Among all the movements, the most consistent movement has been the anti-rape movement. Started way back in 1980 with a need for law reform. So you might know about the Mathura rape case. She was a young tribal girl of 16 years, around 16, 15, 16 years. She was raped inside the police station by two policemen on duty. And a complaint was registered because of the pressure from her family members. She was poor. She was illiterate. She was an orphan. She was working as a maid servant in somebody's house. And she was raped by the boy of that, that house itself. But due to uh, the support person that she had, particularly her brother or her neighbors who were waiting for her, a case was registered. The sessions court gave a verdict that this was consent and it was not raped because this woman was of easy virtue, they said, because she had eloped with a boy. Uh, she had a boyfriend. She was a tribal girl, 15, 16 year old. But they said because she's not uh, of good moral character, she cannot be raped. This is what the sessions court verdict was. Because of the public pressure from the women's groups, it was one of the first cases taken up by women's groups. Uh, particularly, it is the case in Maharashtra, a Nagpur site, Gatchiruni. So uh, then, when it went to uh, High Court, High Court reversed the judgment and convicted the policeman. The policeman went to Supreme Court. And in the Supreme Court, in 1978, the verdict came, reversing the High Court judgment. Holding that uh, Mathura's statement is not trustworthy, she again reaffirming that she is not a woman of good character. For us, uh, for the women's movement, this was a very important point that how can the Supreme Court think like this? Because as we know, Supreme Court judgments are the law of the land. So if the Supreme Court thinks like this about women, that also in such a vulnerable position as opposed to a policeman on duty, then what was going to be the plight of the rest of the women? So this was taken up due to a letter uh, written by four law teachers. But the women's movement took it up majorly. And 1980, March 8, was marked as an anti-rape law day. So after that, there was a demand for changes in the rape law. With a consistent campaign, 
and in 1983 the rape law was changed the rape law was changed by uh, making um, marking certain minimum punishment that uh, seven years for ordinary rape gang rape for rapes in special situations like a uh, pregnant woman child under 12 years uh, such other uh, custodial the one uh, if the woman is in a shelter home or a public hospital and there she is raped etc that it would be 10 years minimum punishment so that was a big victory there was also said that a victim's name should not be published and uh, uh, publishing any uh, uh, name and identity publishing became an offense so this was the major points there but over the years we see till today also we see the law has not had the desired impact the acquittals are major uh, more than 70 80 percent are acquittals even when a case is reported only about 20 25 percent are convictions but more than that most cases are not even reported unless a case like this today's jarkin rape case comes up um, historical notorious um, uh, inviting public attention etc most cases are not registered and if a rape happens within the family it is totally ignored so this is the situation for us where rape is concerned and there have been so many adverse judgments the ju judiciary has been extremely hostile to women always siding with the accused so if you, if you, uh, uh, excuses are given that the uh, uh, accused is a sole uh, breadwinner of the family the, uh, he is a very young member of the family um uh, he is a juvenile etc and no sufficient attention is given to the victim and there is always suspicion about the victim she must have told lies she must have implicated somebody. She must have consented and then she changed her mind. So these are all the biases that operate in our courts. Even today, if you see that, go and sit in a trial court and see how a rape trial takes place. And what are the questions the defense lawyer asks this young girl? And she has no support. She has absolutely no support. The public prosecutor is, who is supposed to defend her is least interested. And she has to face a defense lawyer who is very well versed in criminal law. The woman can be an illiterate woman, she can be a child, um, she can be a, a, a rural woman who doesn't understand the court and the procedures. Nobody is there to explain to her. So it is very unevenly balanced. And it's no wonder it results in acquittals. Unless there is support uh, network, uh, we cannot get conviction. So Madhli's the organization uh, that I started provides legal support to victims, particularly uh, child victims. And from the time of the FIR, our team stands with her. Till the court, till she comes to court and give evidence, at least she'll have somebody who is supporting her throughout the trial. And with that, we have managed to increase the conviction rate. This is one of the important works of Madlis. And in uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2005, uh, 2005, we got the uh, uh, POXO Act. Uh, sorry, 2012, we got the POXO Act, which is uh, Protection of Children Against Sexual Violence Act. Now, your children now are taken out of the IPC criminal law and they're placed under this special law. Now, what's special about this law? Because there is a child-friendly procedure you must follow. The way the investigations are done by a police officer is, uh, uh, should be in a child-friendly manner. The police officer should not be in uniform. Uh, uh, preferably, a woman police officer should be investigating. Uh, the courts are specially designed the uh, preferably a woman judge. If there's no woman judge, at least a very sensitive and sympathetic male judge. And uh, uh, the support person has to be there. The 
child welfare committee can appoint a support person to be with the victim. So these are the changes that we have brought about. But even then, it is not satisfied. Even then, we are not getting results. But it has been very, very difficult uh, journey for us. Uh, now, with this law, one important thing is that supposing a doctor finds out that a child is sexually abused, doctor is mandated to report. If a uh, teacher finds out through the uh, child's conduct behavior in school that she is undergoing trauma at home and she's been sexually uh, abused by her own father or brother or uncle, etc., even the teacher is mandated to report. So with this, a lot of cases are now coming up of family abuse. Young children are subjected male or female. This law applies to males and females under the age of 18. So, um, so one um, negative point is here that even consensual sex is not allowed under 18. So that also is getting punished and it can be reported. So where it happens, where it comes to know is where usually this child is pregnant. And then she is taken to the hospital. She is not aware that she is pregnant. And through that, even a consensual sex is comes to light. And then the case is spiked. So this law is very draconian in some sense. But it was necessary to bring these cases out in the open. Without it, we will not be able to detect a lot, many cases. So this has been our experience. And we have, uh, uh, particularly as Madris uh, lawyers, our uh, duty is to support these uh, ch child victims particularly, help them at every stage, make them understand what is a criminal court, make them understand what is a trial, criminal trial, and how they have to respond uh, or more importantly, what is there in the FIR? And that FIR, on that FIR, she's asked questions. But she doesn't know what is written in the FIR. She's illiterate. Police have recorded this. She has no access to documents. So our duty is to understand all this, to explain to the girl what is there in the FIR, and to train her as to what kind of questions can be asked so that she's able to answer these questions. This trial is such a uh, traumatizing experience. Even if any of you are placed in the court and are asked to answer questions, you will not be able to. It is extremely difficult. And the case will fail. So this is where we have identified the major problem. And we have tried to uh, rec uh, rectify it. So this is about the rape and uh, sexual uh, uh, abuse cases, both within the IPC and under the POXO Act. <coughs> so the POXO Act is a very uh, important landmark in our whole history of anti-rape campaign. And it's only because of child rights groups and women's rights groups that we have this law in place today. But unfortunately, a lot of people are not aware of it. And unless there's a problem in our personal life, we are not concerned about what happens, where is the law reform happening, how it is affecting us, how it is affecting the society, how it is affecting the um, neighbors or relatives or near, near and dear ones. We are not bothered. We just uh, try to understand only the superficiality, what comes in the newspapers, headlines, etc. But otherwise, we are not concerned what, what to do. In fact, in a lot of cases, people ask us, what should we do? How should we report? Doctors and uh, police are not recording the case. What should we do? Where should we go? So these are some important uh, issues we need to understand. So I'll move to the next issue. Excuse me. So another major issue of the women's movement as somebody mentioned earlier, is uh, dowry harassment and domestic violence. So in 1980s, apart from rape, 
the uh, news highlights used to be of uh, term was used called dowdy death particularly in the north indian uh, uh, cities a girl would be burnt soon after her marriage and when she is burnt we would call it a dowry death and a criminal law was amended so again there was a demand for rape law for uh, the uh, uh, domestic violence reform so uh, 498a was brought in where family violence was recognized for the first time and it was punished uh, there was a law for this uh, called 498a it's got lot of badnam so to say but it was a very important legislation that <coughs> uh, 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 a domestic violence was addressed as dowry harassment not as domestic violence and uh, our husband's family could be charged with harassing the woman with the demand of dowry and there was another uh, amendment Ah, this is the four B. If a woman dies an unnatural death within seven years of her marriage, then it would be unnatural death. It would be implied that the husband family is responsible for this, and the burden of proof would be on them that they didn't do it, rather than on the girl, on the girl's family, or the police that they did it. now this is reversing the major principle of criminal law because under criminal law an offense has to be proved by the prosecution the defense doesn't have to do anything but in this case when the girl died in her husband's home it was impossible to prove it because the family would not report it before that she's been harassed there would be no letters no nothing only after she died the family will come and say she was harassed and she was burnt even in a dying situation women will not implicate their husbands because the small children at home what will happen to them etc so it was a very precarious situation so the rules of evidence got changed and that uh, uh, that uh, prosecution didn't have to prove the defense had to prove if there was a harassment earlier if there were threats if she was sent back all these uh, will come as evidence and uh, leading to conviction <coughs> you can hear conviction was very less most of the case the bias within the judiciary was very high even though the woman has died they would think that everybody is telling lies the girl's family is telling lies etc and it continues till now 498304b etc as uh issues where um women are not trusted their families are not trusted now here we are under a dichotomy because when she is suffering when the marriage is on nobody wants to talk about it nobody wants to break a marriage so they will cover it supposing there is a dowry demand she sent back home the family will prefer to meet that demand give that additional money give that ornaments or whatever and save the marriage so your basic premise is that marriage must be saved at any cost and the girl must adjust now that thinking has not changed till now it is the same thing so the earlier question was there why it doesn't happen what happens after the even when there is a domestic violence act etc after much uh, campaign this criminal it was realized that the criminal law doesn't work and we need a civil law so in 2005 we got a civil law called domestic violence act um so domestic violence act is a civil remedy so anybody who is harassed by her husband or in laws etc can uh, approach the court and ask for certain remedies civil remedies so there is no imprisonment here nobody sent to jail but the woman's rights are protected rights like uh court will grant an injunction that husband cannot harass her or in laws cannot harass her uh protection from domestic violence 
protection from throwing her out of the matrimonial home, maintenance for her, and child custody. These are the five remedies available under the Act. And the proceedings are civil, but they are in the criminal court of magistrate court. Why so? Because civil courts are expensive. And magistrate court is the first court of the lowest degree. And where litigation are very expensive. There are also protection officers appointed for supposed to help the woman. She doesn't have to go to a uh, lawyer and pay money. These are government employees. The there is a format which has to uh, the protection officer can fill in about the date of uh, marriage, addresses, etc., and the incidents of violence. How often she was harassed? Where she was? How, she, how many times she was sent back? How? Uh, what kind of harassment, etc.? It's not a very formal petition. You can do a formal petition, but if you can't have a lawyer, you can do informally also filling up this form. So this is a landmark ruling, a landmark law, which uh, women's groups help to draft. And according to me, in all the laws, this is making us some sort of impact. So a lot of women are going to court. It's not arresting the husband or arresting the in-laws, but just protecting her rights, protecting her rights to stay in that house, protecting her right to maintenance, Protecting her rights not to be beaten, not to be uh, traumatized in the husband's home. So this is very, very important. And a lot of cases that we get, when the women come and complain, my husband is harassing me, he's threatening me, he's threatening to throw me out, he's threatening to take my children away, etc. We file under this law. So that has worked uh, not very well, but relatively well. And the law, law prescribes a time frame that within six months, the case has to be decided. It doesn't happen in six months, but at least there is some pressure on the judiciary to decide the case very fast. So from the criminal uh, case of 304B and 498A, we moved to the civil side and asking for remedies for the woman rather than punishment for the accused. So this is a big uh, transition for us and for women in general. But most people are not aware what is a Domestic Violence Act? How does it protect women? So it's very important that we understand it. Uh, so uh, then there are many other issues that have come up within the women's uh, movement. The dowry law now has changed to domestic violence. Because all harassment is not dowry related. There, um, earlier, the presumption was if a woman is harassed, it's a mother in law who is harassing her, and there is a demand for dowry, that's why she is harassed. With this premise, ordinary uh, violence that is happening at home every day was not addressed at all. Emotional violence, uh, mental trauma, all that is not addressed at all. So, with the change, in the definition of domestic violence, where we say yeah, sexual, emotional, financial, etc., even not giving maintenance, you can go under the set. Uh, because that is also a uh, violence on the woman. So it is very uh, uh, wide and very, very uh, helpful for the women to come under this fact. Uh, other issues that women's movement took up. Yeah, uh, I've got a lot of case laws and all, but there's not uh, time to go through the case law. Uh, 1986, there was a campaign to uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, commercial uh, trafficking of women for this sexual act called uh, anti-prostitution act. So there were there are two types of prostitution. One is women, uh, young girls are trafficked and sold into prostitution against their wishes. And they're kept there under the supervision or uh, control of a so-called garwali or the mistress 
who is using their bodies to earn money. But there are others uh, who are on their own and with their own will, they want to do prostitution. So there are two kinds of debates that are going on. One is uh, groups of uh, uh, or collectives of sex workers who are not forced into prostitution, but they say, this is my body and I have a right to do what I want with my body. If you want to earn a living with my using my body, I have the right to do so. But my uh, I have, have to be protected. I should have health protection. I should have a voter's card. I should be uh, treated as a citizen. Uh, my children should have admission in schools, etc. So to protect these rights, certain uh, groups have been formed in some pockets, not everywhere. Uh, but uh, this right is protected. On the other side, if you see in Bombay, we have a place called Kamathipura, where there are a lot of uh, girls are kept captive. They're sold into prostitution. They're kept there. And that is uh, prohibited by the law. And there is a punishment for uh, procuring the girls, trafficking the girls, sending them abroad, keeping them uh, in a... Uh, uh, in, uh, um, uh, this uh, pr prison like says and uh, somebody making money out of their bodies. Now in such a situation you must you hear about it rescue operation by the police. The police go there, raid it and rescue it. But the sad fact is there is a collusion between the police and the Garwalis. It's not as apparent that police are always acting in favor of the victim girls. They are also hand in love with the so-called Garwalis and the traffickers. So that has been a problem area. There are some groups who are working on this, but uh, this is uh, uh, this is a great issue that uh, we had to uh, work towards it, develop our understanding, uh, develop why women get into prostitution, how they can come out of it, and how, what is the support they need. So this has been another campaign. Then there is another uh, issue that came up, indecent representation of women. But this is in the media, posters, films, advertisement, where women's bodies are exposed. And uh, uh, for this, there is a law that indecent women cannot be represented indecently in public forums. And you can file a case against it. So this has been uh, another issue that uh, for us. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll try to do something. We will see uh, at a later stage. I'll coordinate with everybody and see what we can do. Okay. So uh, indecent representation. With my papers are very detailed. Uh, which is not necessary for you all. Uh, for you all, this much is more than enough actually. Uh, a lot of case law, a lot of references, etc. So this uh, campaign uh, was very active in the 1980s. Most of these have been 1980 campaign. And uh, a law was uh, passed making it a stringent offense that uh, anybody uses a woman's body for uh, viewing pressure, obscenity, or uh, public exposure of a woman's nude body, etc. So there is certain um, criteria developed. There were some groups who were opposed to this, that a woman's choice, she can expose her body if she wants. But in the women's movement, there was a um, resistance regarding that. And they said, no, uh, we have to pro uh, protect the woman as well as the general public. And uh, even in the films, there's a censor board, and uh, certain if there is exposure, obscenity, etc., those scenes are cut. Uh, only then they get a licensed uh, sensor certificate to view the film. So we all know about it. So this is indecent representation uh, of women. Uh, so another very important issue uh, that came up, which... Uh, I want to highlight at this point, and this is issue is still with us, called selective uh, female feticide or female uh, abortions. That you, uh, I, 
when a pregnant woman is pregnant, you make her uh, go through a, a sex determination test. And if it is found to be a female child, uh, female fetus, uh, doctors encourage you and family wants to abort so that only male children are born. Female children are not born. So Vibhuti, myself, we were very active in this campaign. And a uh, law was passed first in 1988 in Maharashtra. Then in 1994, all over India. The doctors are now prevented from conducting such a test. And all the uh, radiology centers have to display very publicly that we don't do these tests. Uh, uh, so that nobody can ask for it. And uh, uh, why this is so? Because our uh, sex ratio is going down. Though uh, women, uh, females are supposed to be more in number than men, for a thousand uh, uh, men, there should be more than thousand women. But in India, it is falling down. Particularly, it's falling down where people are more wealthy. Because you have to pay money for it. Uh, so in Bombay, in Sholapur, etc., there are very less uh, girls per thousand men. Sometimes it's come down to as less as eight foot from thousand. So, uh, and there is a big racket going on. The doctors are trying to earn money by putting the fear of dowry in the uh, minds of the families, saying that spend now 5,000 for, uh, uh, for a test rather than spending 5 lakhs on dowry later. And the uh, uh, couples uh, and the families fall for it. And this is, though the woman herself may want it, her family may want it, we think as a public uh, issue, policy issue, this should not be there. And women, uh, women should not be selectively killed through this procedure of a female feticide. Earlier, we should do female uh, uh, infanticide. Girls were, uh, infants were killed because they were girls. And this is the modern version of it, female feticide. So uh, on that also, there was a lot of campaign, a lot of cases in the Supreme Court, etc. Maharashtra had an ordinance regulation in 1988 and 2000 uh, and 1994, a central law was passed. But even then, it required a lot of monitoring so that actually it reaches the people. And doctors are made aware and the doctors are punished. The woman herself is not punished, but her family is punished and the doctors are punished. So this is the... Uh, Sex determination test, uh, uh, sex selective abortion. That's an important campaign that we have. So I think I've spoken quite extensively. And if there are questions, I will answer them. Thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, for and your uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for this session. Your expertise and perspective have added tremendous values to our collective understanding of this crucial issue. So, before moving to the questions, I would like to call upon Professor Vibhuti, ma'am, to make her remarks on the session. India has explained step by step how to deal with the question of violence and based on her first-hand experience. So I think that gives, enhances the confidence of participants who are also active in different fields that we can also bring the changes. Uh, during 80s and 90s, we did it collectively. So I think there is also a need to form the groups, women's collective or the women's organization so that we can strike in a collective manner and bring effective results. So... It's a very inspiring session that Flavia has given and uh, her legal experience and legal expertise has also played a very important role in providing very nuanced understanding on various types of gender-based violence. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Now the floor is open for questions from the audience. Yeah, so first question is by Ishmit Kaur Chaudhary. Will you unmute and speak? Yeah, uh, ma'am, uh, actually, some of these uh, dowry uh, deaths, I mean, some earlier, like these dowry deaths were quite prominent, but uh, now they have definitely come down quite a bit. But at the same time, the repression has not 
decreased. So in okay. some way or in, in some fancy ways, you know, the dowry is huh? continuing to be, uh, I mean, given out huh? and all given. So, uh, so basically, this is kind of hidden forms in which, you know, I mean, lavish parties or lavish weddings and then giving out of gifts to daughters and others. So, uh, so on one hand, we see a concrete law. And on the other hand, we see that the society is still promoting it. Right. So there is kind of a gap in these two things. Uh, you know, which which I think needs to be addressed, and and I don't know like where to go. Uh, in that sense, like uh, how do we kind of read that? It's just like we comment, we observe, and then there's nothing that can be done about it. Or is there anything that can be done about it? Okay, I want to respond to you in two different ways. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, respond to uh, the whole issue of dowry as a financial settlement. Now, most families give dowry because they don't give a, a share in a property. Hmm. So how do we ensure that girl gets something at least? Hmm. So if, if we cannot be sure at all, because by will, uh, she is deprived of hmm. her rights. Hmm. Uh, now, after the 2005 amendment, at least uh, all property could not be built away. But now Uttarakhand UCC has taken away that right also. So now all property can be built away. So now uh, giving gift, why do parents give gift or money, etc. to the girl? I'm not talking about in-laws and husband. I'm talking about gifts to the girl. Uh, they give an AC, they give a car, they give a house, whatever they give. At least... But they should ensure that it is given in the girl's name, not in the husband's name, not in the husband's family's name. They don't do that. And that is the problem. So I have no problem uh, with giving gifts to the daughter mm -hmm. uh, uh, as against property rights. But the property rights are much more in value. So mm -hmm. we, uh, while we say no dowry should be given, simultaneously we have to say she should get equal uh, right in property. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't happen at all. So, uh, dowry, uh, this financial settlement for the girls is a very tricky issue. And somewhere, women's movement has not addressed it correctly. Mm -hmm. That How do we ensure that mm -hmm. girls get their share in the property? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Actually, that, that share in the property is something which is more substantial and that is continuously being denied. You know, or, absolutely, uh, absolutely. or some parents want to just give 60, 40 kind of a share. Okay, give 40. No, they don't want to give anything. They just yeah. make a baby, give her some gifts and um, we'll get over, yeah. over it. Let me see. Ma'am, I have a question. Yeah, Manish Ma'am, ma what proactive measures can policymakers take to strengthen the enforcement of gender violence policies and ensure the accountability within the governance structures? there has to be a greater focus on implementation and monitoring that implementation by NGO groups. Most of the time, the campaigns are oriented regarding law reform. But subsequent to that, it's a long, lengthy procedure to uh, ensure that implementation happens. Most of the time, implementation does not happen. The police are very lax. And uh, the culprits are not booked at all. So it is important for a civil society, for people like us, to monitor the implement. When we know about a case, we need to follow it up so that its implementation is proper. If the implementation is not proper, then we are not able to handle the situation. Uh, we are not able to get the conviction, which means the law will not act as a deterrent. So that's very important for uh, watch uh, to be very watchful of how the law gets implemented. And then, of course, there's so much badnam that when a law <coughs> gets implemented to whatever extent, there's always this whole thing about misuse. Women are misusing, women are misusing, etc. So we need to be very alert and we need to be very watchful. Nobody's talking about 80% of the cases not filed. Everybody talks about the 20% of the cases that are filed. 
where we say this is false case. So we are stuck between a false case and non-implementation. So we need to be very much hands-on here so that this kind of uh, uh, yeah, misguidance and uh, adverse propaganda is stopped. We always have to uh, uh, distrust the women. We think that women are misusing the law. At the other level, we, we say women are not using the law. They are not aware. Both can't be true. So we need to be very much alert and put proper facts out in the public. Write about it. Uh, be in the public domain. Talk about it, etc. So that uh, the true facts uh, come to light. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, can I ask one thing? This is a very wonderful presentation. Uh, both the presentations are very insightful. Uh, but just uh, a small, uh, you know, maybe your insight on this. You talk about the POXO Act, but, um, and, uh, you know, how people are not aware about it. Uh, but there, there is, uh, you know, there is a kind of another level, uh, debate at another level, which says that, uh, uh, you know, the, the young girls wanted to marry and uh, uh, their parents, they, if they don't want their, uh, uh, you know, girls to marry out, uh, out of the caste or religion or whatever, so then they use POXO Act and uh, rape laws and other laws. So uh, you know, uh, how should we, you know, go about dealing with that kind of situation? Um, that is a very a real concern. A lot of groups are talking about it. Uh, consensual sex. Uh, why do you penalize a consensual sex? Uh, when a girl and boy won't want to be engaged. They can't get married because they are underage. It's under 18. But uh, they can be in a relationship. Uh, but that is not allowed under POXO. So there is a debate whether you know consensual relationship should be taken out. But here the problem is how do we judge consent? When a girl is 14, 15 uh, uh, and she is in a relationship, whether it is due to pressure or whether it is out of her free will, very difficult to judge. And sometimes she's pregnant. Then what do we do? So uh, it's a very complicated issue. Madhvi says uh, found that in most of the cases where the girl is, girl is pregnant uh, and uh, when you say she's consent, she's sent to a home, she's kept there, her child is taken away, a lot of things happen. So how do we handle it? So we have uh, dealt with such situations and there are a lot of groups uh, also saying that consensual relationships should be taken out of POXO, which has not happened right now. Some judges also have commented on this, is that uh, you are harassing young people it's under this law. But uh, there are pros and cons to the whole thing. It's not very simple. Ma'am, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, so I'm Pallavi again. And uh, so, ma first of all, it's so good to hear you speak again. The last session I attended of yours was at Ashoka University, where you were also uh, a part of the Summer of Ish, uh, you know, uh, session. So my question is that, can the language of law be kept deliberately ambiguous and complex in order to hinder easy understanding of it? And in that case, does accessing the law and legal measures not become a problem? And if so, what are the potential remedies to make access easy? Can you uh, shortly uh, repeat it in a short form? Uh, yeah, that? sure. So my question is essentially that what is the relationship that is shared by law and language, shared between law and language? As in the language of law tends to be complex at time, which makes it hard for, say, people who don't access, uh, who don't have access to good or so-called good language, it makes it very hard for them to avail or, you know, take recourse to legal measures. So my question is, how do we, uh, you know, sort of uh, take steps towards that? How do we make access to law easy? Actually, you are right. Actually, the language of law is extremely difficult. Even when a petition is filed, they make it so legal and complicated that you cannot understand your own petition. But nowadays, the time is to make it more simple. Now, if you see the Domestic Violence Act, it's much more, the language is much more simple rather than a very complicated uh, issue. Uh, so somewhere we need, I understand what you're saying about language of the law. 
and we need to simplify it and uh, it's demystify a, demystify also demystify the law make it more simple make it more understanding for the people for the ordinary people to understand you should not need a lawyer to interpret it for you you should be able to uh, interpret it uh, yourself and you should know your rights this is a very valid question and uh, there is a lot of campaigns about it to make the law more simple and straightforward so wherever there are complicated uh, uh, issues NGOs like us bring out simple uh, publications to demystify the law. So, uh, and many law books are written, etc., but they are also written in a very complicated manner. So, uh, we need to really work towards making law, uh, language of the law, more simple. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for answering my question. Can they very be nice from question. Majlis website, the PDFs of these booklets? Uh, I, I don't know. I will check. Uh, yeah. Ma'am, yeah. I have one more question. Yeah. Like since we are saying there is one more emerging vulnerable section of LGBTQ, except the women minority only. So there are individuals who may encounter hostile or unwelcoming environments in workplaces, be it schools or other spaces as well. And that can create a condition conducive to se sexual harassment. And these discriminate, discriminatory attitudes and behaviors contribute, a, contribute to a culture of impunity for perpetrators and a silence for victims. So what all steps we can take except for creating awareness so that these issues can be addressed properly? Uh, LGBTQ uh, issues are uh, more recent and emerging issues. Uh, there are support groups there and... Uh, 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 Many uh, LGBTQ people become part of these support groups who are there with them when uh, their rights are violated. But I agree with you that uh, a lot of uh, couples are closeted. They don't want to come because there is a fear that what will happen when they come out. Even their own parents may not know. They may uh, throw them out, etc. So uh, we need to create a lot more awareness and protect their rights. And there is so much bias against same-sex relationships, uh, uh, gay couples, and uh, lesbian couples, etc. And we need to, uh, very good question, I think very contemporary question. And uh, uh, there is a lot we need to do regarding this. Uh, we've not done sufficient. And particularly women's, in women's group, there are certain pockets who are doing this. But uh, generally, the women's movement have not addressed this sufficiently. So we need to attend, address it much more. Very good question. I agree with you. Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, if anyone from the participants have any question. Okay. So thank you, ma'am, for being with us here today and patiently answering all the questions. And we just answered the question about reading lists. We have already received the reading list, readings from the party. So they will be shared, no? Mr. Manish has asked. Just yes, make it now. Yeah, yeah. Manish Kumar. Mama, I received the mail. Mail, na? Okay, okay. Yeah. Yes. So yes, thank you, ma'am, for being with us here today and patiently answering all the questions. It was a pleasure to get insights from your valuable experience. And we wish to continue for more collaborations with you in future. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So now moving ahead, I would like to call upon Shalu, ma'am, for her brief overview over the session that is violence against gender-based violence. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I, um, I'll just, uh, uh, you know, it's it's a very small kind of, uh, you know, uh, thing which I just want to uh, make. So this is about, uh, you know, I just, uh, within the past two, three days, I read this news headline uh, about this Belkis Bano case. I uh, Many of you may have read this about this case uh, in the, uh, you know, social media uh, newspapers and TVs. And, uh, you know, how... Uh, 
was very difficult for her to get the justice. She has to go to the Supreme Court and finally, uh, you know, the convicts have been released uh, on, on, you know, 15th of August or their good conduct by the Gujarat government. Uh, the Supreme Court said that it was wrong. And then, uh, uh, you know, again, they were asked to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, complete their sentence. And uh, now again, uh, uh, Two of them, like out of 11 convicts, two have applied for, uh, you know, uh, to say that uh, uh, we, we need to crush this, this remission petition. So, you know, these kind of, uh, this kind of thing. And then uh, ma'am has already shared uh, this, uh, uh, you know, that uh, how this foreign woman was raped. Uh, but more, my concern was this, you know, uh, the, the chairperson of the National Commission for Women, the way she responded uh, to to her you know social media post and uh, uh, like you know it was again the culture of blaming the victim again we are you know uh, uh, raising and uh, though we say our country uh, the basics the thing is that atiti devo bhava but uh, you know instead of helping the the victim what we are you know uh, spreading the message that is my the concern I just want to flag here. And uh, also this news I uh, saw yesterday, where uh, a person who is serving life imprisonment in, in, in a POSCO act, and uh, the women who are taking out rallies to, to us demanding the release of uh, the, the rape convict. Uh, and of course, there are, there are other cases which I'm not you know, going into the details, but we have seen in Manipur, violence, how women, you know, uh, complaints are being ignored and, uh, you know, uh, uh, the actions are not being taken against the culprit. And I can go on and on uh, we, what we are seeing and uh, the National Crime Record Bureau data, which says uh, released in December 2023, and it says that 51 cases of violence against women are being reported every hour and 4.4 lakh cases in 22, uh, 2022 were reported, and this is up by 4% in 2023. So, um, uh, uh, so you know, these are the kind of things which are going on. But at the international uh, level, uh, on, on Women's Day, that is March of 8, uh, for 2024, the theme is Invest in Women, Accelerate Progress. Uh, they are talking about tackling economic disempowerment of women. Uh, why they are talking about this? Because all over the world, uh, the report says that 5% of government aid is focused on tackling violence against women and less than 0.2% is directed towards prevention. And uh, 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 another point it says is that uh, staggering uh, 360 billion US dollars, uh, you know, there is a deficient uh, uh, deficiency in that in spending on gender equality measures so um uh, and if this trend continues uh the 340 million women and girls that is eight percent of world female population will live in extreme poverty by 2030 and that the gender gap in power and leadership is also persisting and it may take another 26 years to reach gender equality in public life so um what this uh, International Women's Day, uh, what uh, the action they are proposing is five key areas needing joint action. They say investing in women uh, as a human right issue. Uh, they say they are, they are talking about ending poverty. And they say that um, 75 million people have fallen into severe poverty since 2020. Immediate action is crucial. Uh, to prevent uh, women and girls uh, who are uh, 342 million, uh, uh, they are living in poverty and we have to end that. And uh, another point is implementing in gender responsive, responsive financing, uh, shifting to green economy and care society uh, and supporting feminist change makers. So, um, uh, you know, uh, this is the very first day and here I'm talking about considering uh, the, the things which are going uh, at the international level when they're talking about investing in women's and girls and the things which are happening nationally, uh, you know, the culture of impunity which is being created. So how can we achieve balance, uh, you know, in these kind of two different kind of situations? 
so um, and we all have a role to play in uh, ending gender based violence so how can we stop uh, violence against women so this program uh, uh, basically you know it's there to uh, you know we can where we can share our you know the kind of actions we are taking at ground level so um, those people who want to uh, present their you know creative ideas because last uh, time we have uh, this course and a lot of uh, new and good things have come up a lot of creative ideas have come up so i would request you to please come up with slogans there were songs there were uh, posters make uh, very good posters so you know you can come up with all those ideas and you can share with us um so i'll just end here and uh, with this quote that we all know what the problems are we all know what we have promised to achieve what is needed now is not more of declaration or promises but also action to fulfill the promises already made so what uh, you know uh, action we are proposing to fulfill all those promises that we have to think about and i'll just stop here uh, so thank you bhanvi for giving me this opportunity i'll stop sharing my slide and uh, thank you so much ma'am for making us aware with the empirical impacts and how serious this situation is and what all steps we need to take in this domain that is being neglected thank you so much ma'am so with the chair's permission we can start with the participants introduction yes we request the participants to kindly unmute themselves and introduce themselves by mentioning their name organization's name their academic or work background and why they wanted to opt for this course to take turns kindly raise hands on the platform and we will call out your name starting with mr manish kumar yeah uh, yes ma'am uh, my name is manish kumar uh, currently i am a final year uh, social ma sociology student pursuing from central university of haryana so i chose this uh, course because one reason is that uh, we have been taught uh, sociology of gender as a course and also my dissertation topic uh, uh, hangs around it i'm looking at the marriages uh, and uh, practices uh, in tribes so yeah thank you nati professor nati hey ma'am yeah introduce your work yeah yeah uh, i'm nati uh, we a uh, sakhya women's guidance cell works for domestic violence from last uh, 36 years i am part of it from last 5 years commendable work which uh, sakhya the uh, cell is doing in college of social work that is one of the main persons yeah. uh, next we can move to ishmit ji ishmit ji yeah she is raised yeah um my name is dr ishmit kaur chaudhary i work in the center for english studies at central university of gujarat my larger work has been uh, on literature of the margins and i worked on um, uh, creating uh, stories and particularly literature on 1984 anti sikh violence where again um, you know uh, there were cases when women did not report about uh, uh body molestation there was not a single fir uh, registered uh, you know uh, 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 for those cases and that was my interest which got me particularly into women studies and now i teach women studies and uh, practice of writing so um, i wanted to do this course primarily because uh, in a somewhere i am in this quest of finding some kind of a a uh, practical solution or you know something where i can kind of contribute practically towards the lives of many women that was my that is my basic reason to be here thank you thank you ma'am uh, next we can move to uh, pallavi ji uh, hi good evening everyone this is pallavi girolkar uh, i uh, am an engineer and i have done my post graduation diploma in public policy and sustainable development currently i am working with clean energy access network but uh, during my uh, post graduation we have a subject on uh, this gender based economy and policies uh, uh, based on gender equality so uh, this topic actually got my interest 
and i have been working uh, with uh, um, some of ngos uh, who are working in field of uh, education and uh, making awareness spreading awareness in uh, uh, rural societies and uh, economically back backward societies so i wanted some um, like a uh, local uh, solution or some core solution for uh, these uh, situations and problems which women are facing uh, in the society so that's why i joined it and are you working this... in rural maharashtra uh, no no i am working in uh, my organization is based in pune uh and we are working in solar energy and uh, uh, distributed uh, renewable energy sector as of now but yes i want to change my <laughs> way of path of work and i want to work something uh, based on gen gender equality and maybe in agriculture and uh, sort of that thing thank you thanks thank you pallavi ji now we can move to anushri banerji Anushri Banerjee, could you please unmute yourself? Hello, my audible. Yes, uh, yes, ma'am. Ah, uh, yeah. So I'm actually not Anushri. I'm actually Pallavi. So the thing is that I enrolled for the course, and uh, link the Zoom link accidentally was then sent to me, and I have had a chat with IMPRI. They have said that they're going to send me a link tomorrow. So I joined using my friend's link, who is also a particip participant. So I am Pallavi Chakraborty. I am currently pursuing BA from Saint Xavier's College. I've also completed my masters in English literature from Saint Xavier's, and I am also an independent researcher. My research areas include minority literature, uh, trauma studies, uh, memory studies, and uh, gender studies. Particularly, I'm very interested in queer studies. and how the field has you know evolved over the years thank you ma'am uh, now next we can move to seema malhotra ji hi this is seema malhotra and uh, i am a founder of scope plus and for last 20 30 years we worked in tihar jail so i worked more with criminals who were per perpetuating crime on the women than you know real victims but still uh, last 2008 uh 2008 i joined delhi police for gender sensitization through uh, justice sunanda bhandare foundation then 2012 with this uh, case really made me you know go into depression and whole lot of stuff happened to me cuz i'm very emotional that's why you know i got too impacted by that case and they were in my jail in a sense they were uh, you know jail number 4 they were working so i decided not to do anything for few years and but that made me think you know this is not correct and then i went back to gender sensitization and then kathua case actually really created havoc in my mind and my body and then i decided okay i'll only talk about awareness and training so i am doing good touch bad touch and i am on posh committees for corporates and ministries and colleges but i wanted to get back into a group work what one of the speakers really rightly said that you know see i have been an individual for so many years now uh, you know i can't do so much but same thing you know we have been talking in 1975 you mentioned dr professor vibhuti that same essay which i wrote in my 16th year and today we are talking the same it's really sad but then positive things are happening that's great so i would like to get back into a group work instead of just being an island you know can't survive like that thank you so much thank you ma'am next we have prateep prashotman ji uh, hi good evening everybody uh, i am prateep uh, i am from uh, chennai i am from an organization called pcvc international foundation for crime prevention and victim care it's a 21 year old organization working on uh, domestic violence uh, along with domestic violence like now we started focusing on uh, lgbtq uh, people as well uh, my education background is in public policy and since uh, i am looking at research aspects on uh, uh, gender and domestic violence i thought like this course on various laws and everything uh, will be helpful to me so that's why i am here in this course thank you thank you sir next we have shilpi pandey ji ma'am could you please unmute yourself yeah yeah yes. thank you so much hi this is shilpi pandey 
from Uttarakhand. And uh, I have uh, completed my MA and MSW from IGNU, and now I'm uh, pursuing a postgraduate diploma in women and gender studies. So I have joined this group to get more clarity on domestic violence and gender based violence. So I have joined. Thank you so much. Uh, you all have uh, given a nice uh, uh, data, uh, presented data, and uh, nice uh, things uh, you have done. And uh, I think uh, I got more clarity on uh, how we mitigate from uh, gender bias violence. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Arup Kumar Bakshi ji, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, good evening all. Uh, myself, Arup Kumar Bakshi. I am actually working as a professor with uh, Alia University in Kolkata, West Bengal. So I have done my master's in genetics and then I did my MBA. After that, I completed my PhD in business administration. Then I joined academics uh, in a state university. So I have done, uh, I am uh, on the verge of completing my MSW also. So I've been working uh, with projects uh, funded by ICSSR and UGC. And I'm primarily working with uh, the tribal women in the Birbhum district from where I origin. And recently I have been doing projects which covers uh, intangible cultural heritage and the contribution of women uh, in it, particularly with respect to Chou dance, which is one of the most traditional format of dance and the participation of women uh, in preparing and manufacturing the masks of Chou dance. Plus, uh, there is another intangible cultural heritage in West Bengal in the district of Purbo Midna, which is called the Deval Chitra, or the wall painting. <clears throat> uh, so primarily my focus is to understand uh, how gender equality is promoted through this women's participation in the propagation, patronization and preservation of the ICH. And uh, how this, uh, you know, it, it empowers women socially as well as financially, leading them uh, to raise their voice in the decision making in the uh, social issues. Uh, in addition to that, I have been working with the Ekedas Gupta Center for Planning and Development, which is a part of Niti Aayog of Vishwa Bharati University uh, on women entrepreneurship, particularly the local entrep women entrepreneurs who are operating in the Shantini Ketan area. Uh, which is predominantly a tourist uh, spot also. So these are my uh, areas, as a result of which I uh, was particularly interested about this particular workshop. Since I am uh, getting, uh, you know, more and more aware about these gender-related issues, uh, so the deprivation, the disparities, uh, which uh, leads to this kind of violence or attitudes uh, that we are seeing now, and while working on the field also. I get a sense of this. So to understand uh, this in a better way, um, I am I'm really interested to complete this course. It's, an, it's a really privilege to be a part of this course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And I hope you might get gainful insights from this session. And sure, sure. we thank you so much, sir. And we have now Simreen Hussein Ji. Evening, everyone. This is Dr. Sambreen Hussain from National Law University, Lucknow. Uh, I am an assistant professor for past uh, 11 years. And uh, my interest in uh, gender and law has been from my LLB days. In 2006, I was a member of women's studies in Aligarh Muslim University. After that, during my master's also, I was part of a lot of organizations in that regard. And in uh, right now in my this uh, university itself, I am teaching a paper on gender and law, family law, uh, feminist jurisprudence. So my main agenda was like, like for a very long time, I wanted to actually gauge from other people's experiences because people who has been in field, people who are directly dealing with these things. So instead of just teaching theory, I wanted to understand the practicalities of this particular problem, this uh, uh, gender-based violence. And right now I'm associated with a, you know, a legal aid committee of our own uh, organizations and uh, another organization, Ali in Lucknow, who works for women and, you know, women and their empowerment and fighting for justice. So it was just, uh, you know, and then again, I have always been a huge fan of Felvia Ma'am. So whenever it's her, you know, whenever it's like 
I could hear a session I never missed that. I don't know, ma'am, remembers or not, I called her for a session in our university in 2017 as well as 2018. So it was another one of another chance to listen to her. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So as we are through the with the participants' introduction, I request our chair, Professor Vibhuti Patel ji, to kindly share her final remarks on today's sessions. So I think I'm highly impressed by the commitment to the question of uh, combating gender-based violence by the participants of this course. And uh, I'm really, today's session was went off so well. And uh, we all have to now work together uh, to fight against gender-based violence because Women's Movement in India launched the campaigns against this uh, violence way back in the 80s. And now after nearly 40 to 45 years, we need to come up with a far more effective ways of intervention because the the newer and newer forms of violence are coming up and we need to come up. We also need to prepare ourselves uh, to combat this kind of uh, violence in a very effective way. And that yeah. is why I think today's course yeah. that we had overview of the overall situation, the analytical framework in within which we see this issue. And also Dr. Shalu Nigam brought up the question of accountability of the governance structures of the criminal justice system of the community and uh, of uh, the, uh, the lawmakers and judiciary. I think that is very important. The way uh, people are washing off their hands when it comes to violence against women, it's not only happening in our country, but globally we see that there is a backlash which is, fair, uh, which is being faced by women who at one level they are getting empowered and they are moving ahead but at the same time backlash of violence has also become far more aggressive and varied so i think we, this course is going to show us the pathways to come up collectively we'll put our, our heads together and come up with a strategy a long-term strategy as well as the immediate tactics to deal with the violence against women and take the preventive measures. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for beautifully summarizing the entire session. So before winding up today's session, if anyone from the participants would like to introduce themselves, or if I, by mistake I have missed anyone. Uh, and before that, I would just like to introduce one of our participants, Anushri Banerjee. She has written in the chat box. So her mic is not working. She, uh, her name is Anushri Banerjee and she is pursuing BA at St. Xavier College, Kolkata. And this course has interested her because the issue of gender has always intrigued her, primarily because of the blurring of morals, what is right and what is wrong. Everything and every policy is unsurprisingly, unsur though, imposed on women or else their bodies. And they would she would love to know more and expand her knowledge. So any... Uh, any one of the participants who would like to introduce themselves or I missed? Yeah, uh, yes, Taraji. Could you please unmute yourself? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, my name is Tara Sankar. I'm teaching in Delhi University as an assistant professor. I completed my master's and phil and PhD from JNU. So at that time, I learned a lot. And I joined this session just to enrich my understanding. I usually do the gender sensitization in my class every day. Although I teach, I mean, remote sensing and GIS, but I completed my MPhil as well as PhD on crime against women. Basically, my work is on mapping the crimes, and I am fortunate to be taught by Professor Saraswati Raju, and kind of trained by Professor Nevedita Menon. So. Uh, Flavia Agnes, ma'am, hai. Inki hitne saare articles maine cite ki apne PhD or M Phil me. It is good to be here. It is so enriching. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Hope this session. Rachna K Nair. Uh, hi and uh, good good evening all. Uh, I'm Dr. Rajna uh, and I'm work. I've just finished my MD uh, community medicine and I'm working as a faculty in uh, Fathermall America College, Mangalore. And uh, actually, I am planning to do my research in gender based violence. And I came to know about this um, the workshop and uh, it was uh, the first sessions were very really interesting. Thank you very much uh, for the session and I and I hope 
hope to learn a lot from the for uh, the remaining sessions in the coming days thank you all thank you ma'am uh, there is one more in the chat box atri das ji so she is a fellow with tfi and she has attended this uh, she has attended this course because she was interested in the subject very much and tend to do her phd in this subject itself which is why she want to increase her knowledge in this area yeah. i just i'm lucky here again uh, when it, it was asked i just gave about organization but wanted to tell the purpose uh, because uh, we are working in this uh, gender based violence from so many years and my practical knowledge about Uh, like you no, know, there are DV Act and all, but when exactly when we do hand holding with the client and the process which goes, uh, there is a uh, like you no. Know, sometimes there are other things which from the panel and means people from here and the group who is learning together. So lot uh, sharing happens and that will enrich my knowledge. So that's why I have joined this course. Thank you, Professor Nandi. Thank you, ma'am. There is one more participant, Dr. Divya Paul. She is working as assistant professor in anatomy at Father Mueller Medical College, Mangalore. Dr. Neha Samapriya. Uh, yes, ma'am. She is Dr. Divya Paul. Divya Paul. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anatomy department of India. Yes, ma'am. So, ma'am, with your permission, I would like to go ahead with the final vote of thanks. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, as we come to the end of day one of ending gender-based violence, awareness of policies and governance, and online sp national spring school program, a four-week online immersive certificate training course, I, Bhan V, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi. would like to propose a formal vote of thanks on behalf of impri gender impact study center and we are grateful to our experts for day one vibhuti uh, vibhuti patel ji and advocate dr flavia agnes ji and advocate dr shalu nigam ji for taking out their valuable time and allowing the participants to learn from this online certificate program we thank all of our participants who have raised pertinent questions and actively participated in today's deliberation and readings for the session have been shared in your email and a video of the session will also be shared with you for learning purposes so we look forward to welcoming you for our second day of the certification course on 6th march at 6 pm that is tomorrow the theme for day 2 is overview of policy frameworks and the experts are doc advocate dr albertina elmeda dr wahida nanar and advocate shalu nigam ji So we are grateful if you are watching us later on YouTube, listening to us on our various podcasts, or reading our publications. We hope you continue to join in future to our impre web policy talk and web policy learning. Wishing you all a very good evening and thank you. And one announcement: I have already shared my PPT on the chat box and also by email, which impre team will share with you. Sure, the PDF of PPT. Yeah. Thank you.